think what originally got me interested in aging is the uh, fact that I was an only child growing up in a family with a lot of older people. I mean, all of my grandparents were alive. My great grandmother was alive. A lot of their siblings. And so I, I, I got to, you know, watch what happens during the aging process very firsthand. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of my relatives had a very healthy uh, aging process. My grandmother was living in her own house until 101 uh, and then uh, died later on of a heart valve failure. Uh, and then other people in the family were aging more rapidly and having a lot more problems. So I got, kind of got to see what the differences were and, and that made me really interested in what causes aging and why does it differ from one individual to the next. Well, we, we were really the first institution that started with the goal of uh, extending human health span by understanding aging and how aging contributes to disease. So what sets us apart from other you know, medical research institutions is that we're very focused on a common goal. And so all of the professors that we bring in here have that in their minds. They're interested in aging. And even if they work primarily on Alzheimer's disease, they're interested in what is it about aging that gives rise to Alzheimer's disease? So that means that we have a common goal. We're very collaborative. And uh, I think that uh, we all buy into this notion that aging is the biggest risk factor for all of these diseases. And so if we can slow aging, we can prevent many of them at the same time and, at the, and also keep people uh, much more functional as they get older. Well, you know, we're very happy to have other organizations that are working on aging. Look, this is a uh, extremely under-researched field. I mean, we we're looking at the biggest risk factor for all of these diseases, and the National Institute of Health only spends about 0.09 percent of its budget on aging. Uh, the field is starved for resources, and that's really what's holding back discovery. So, when the Sins Foundation started, you know, several years ago. Um, you know, their mission was really similar to ours. Their approach initially was a little bit different in that they were uh, targeting different processes of aging and different research strategies. But I think over the years, uh, uh, our, our approaches have gotten more similar. And so we're happy to collaborate with them. They funded research at the Buck. We've uh, helped train some of their interns as they learn how to do uh, aging research. And I think it's a very healthy, healthy relationship. I think both, uh, but but let me let me elaborate on that a little bit. Certainly, we see macro macromolecular damage, DNA damage, protein damage, as a driver of aging. But we don't think necessarily it's the only driver of aging. I, I think that the investigators here have a little bit broader perspective on that, and that we think there are probably multiple pathways, maybe five to ten pathways, that are the primary drivers of aging, and maybe macromolecular damage is, accounts for one or two of those pathways. So. Uh, we have a lot of basic research on aging that goes beyond just trying to repair micromolecular damage. Um, we also have investigators working on diseases of aging, but again, you know, it's with a focus toward aging. So a lot of the people say that work on Parkinson's disease are collaborating with the basic aging researchers. And instead of just saying, we want to look at Parkinson's disease like it's this unique problem that's different from everything else, we want to say, what is it about aging that causes Parkinson's disease? And how do we work at that interface to try to prevent the disease or develop novel strategies to treat the disease based on what we know about aging? Yeah, I think there have been several breakthroughs that have come from the Buck Institute. Um, one is that, you know, uh, Gordon Lithgow uh, was one of the first people that was really starting to screen for drugs that slow aging. So we've known for two or three decades that there are a lot of genetic interventions that can affect the aging process. And that's work that was done by a lot of labs. I did a lot of work in yeast on sirtuins, for example. But the idea that you could find drugs that slow aging was not as well accepted. And Gordon identified a lot of drugs that slow C. elegans aging. Uh, work from Pankaj Kahi's lab and my lab also uh, we're very focused on the TOR pathway in aging, and so that was some of the driving events that led to the 
National Institute of Aging testing whether rapamycin would affect aging, and that's sort of now the you know gold standard in terms of a drug that slows and balances aging. Um, and then more recently, some of the work from Judy Campisi's lab has been really fundamental in that it's helped uh, to define this senescence-associated secretory program, uh, this idea that cells, when they become senescent, secrete a panel of inflammatory cytokines that affect and maybe drive aging in the neighboring cells in their environment. And so that's led to a biotech company called Unity that's trying to develop drugs that uh, kill senescent cells. So those are some of the major discoveries. There's been a lot of things going on, but um, those are some of the ones that come to mind. Yeah, so this is something that I, I think a lot about because I travel to countries all over the world. Um, let's start with the United States. And you're right, there's a 10 to 15 year difference in average life expectancy between the wealthy and the, and the lower, lower quartile income class. Um, and if you look at it, you know, one of the interesting uh, graphs you can look at is life expectancy by county in the United States. Uh, and uh, it varies a lot, but you could compare that to poverty by county, and it's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence. It really tells you uh, how much of an impact poverty has on aging. And I think part of that is in the, the diets that we eat and the, and the lifestyle we choose. Uh, it, you know, it used to be that some of the cheapest food you could get was healthy food, vegetables and fruits, and now it's some of the most unhealthy food, stuff that's rich and high, uh, high in uh, unprocessed uh, uh, or processed carbohydrates like high fructose corn syrup, junk food, fast food. And I think that's what people are, tend to eat, and it's really causing this obesity epidemic. So there's a really strong link between poverty, obesity, and aging in the United States. And it's something that we could really uh, have a big impact if we could really convince people to, to and give them the means to have a healthier lifestyle. I think it would have a major impact. Um, that's also uh, true globally, you know, and uh, um, again, uh, if you look at uh, countries in Africa, life expectancy can be in the middle 50s still, whereas it's over, you know, almost 85 in Japan. Um, the interesting thing about those countries to me is that it's not just about infectious disease and childbirth mortality. If you look at some of the top killers in those countries, they're diseases of aging, cardiovascular disease. Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So what I think is that the the environment and lifestyle uh, and, and the struggles that these people are facing, higher disease load, are probably accelerating certain aspects of the aging process and causing them to, to face diseases of aging earlier in their life if they get through some of the other challenges. So I think we need to do more research to understand you know, how things like inflammation due to disease, chronic inflammation, uh, uh, how poor nutrition accelerates aging. I think that's a field that we haven't looked enough into. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think there a lot of this is still speculation, but we, you know, we make all of these assumptions uh, about what happens as we get older, and we don't really have a lot of information to to support it. And so, what you know, one of the things you might be referring to is I made a comment recently in a debate that you know, how do you know the, the the other group was saying that you know as we get older we get more conservative and we have less new ideas, and um, they were attributing that to experience or frustration or something. And and I, and I was saying why don't we attribute that to uh, you know decreased. Uh, synaptic connections of neurons that accompany aging or decreased neurogenesis. And, and I think we just don't know. I, I think the fascinating thing is that if we can, we can slow aging, uh, I think we're not only going to prevent disease, we're really going to do a lot of uh, other beneficial things as we get older physiologically that have a big impact on society. So, um, you know, it, you know I, I tell people that I try not to make promises uh, for humans that we can't already do in a mouse, but we can take a mouse, give it a drug, rapamycin, uh, and extend its lifespan by 25 or 30 percent. Now that drug has toxicities, and I'm not advocating people take it yet, but imagine you could have a drug that does a similar thing in humans so that they live 15 years longer, they're protected from a whole range of different diseases, and 
they stay, you know, functional longer. I think they'll be more active. They'll be uh, more have increased cognitive function with age, so that they can combine some of the wisdom they have with aging with the with the you know creative ability that a young person has. I think that the impact of that could be quite profound. So, you know, I'm really excited about where the future can can go if we can really uh, start to make a serious effort at targeting aging. So I think the trial is very important, uh, and the reason is that if we can really begin to do trials around health span, how do we keep people healthy? Uh, it'll open the floodgates, and there'll be a lot of uh, drugs that target aging that can be tested. Maybe that's intermittent rapamycin. Maybe it's a derivative of rapamycin. Uh, maybe it's a different drug. I think there are a lot of candidates coming uh, through the preclinical studies, and will be interesting to test in humans. Um, so metformin is a good first choice, and one of the reasons for that is it's an extremely safe drug. Uh, lot, millions of people take it for diabetes already. We know we know what the uh, we know that most people respond well, and that the few that don't, we understand already what the toxicities are. So uh, I think it's critical that as we start these health span trials, we don't pick a drug that has toxicity, and metformin fits that description pretty well. Uh, in terms of an, a drug that slows aging, I think the data is, is strong, but maybe not as strong as some of the other drugs. So it certainly extends lifespan in worms and flies and mice, although the effects are quite small. And then there are retrospective studies in humans that suggest that it's, it slows aging there as well. So it's definitely worth doing this trial on metformin, and I think that's a good choice for a first drug. Uh, but I think there might be a lot of other things that come down the path after that are, have a much more robust effect. I, you know, I think earlier I referred to the fact that there are probably, you know, five to ten different mechanisms that are probably driving aging. Macromolecular damage may account for a couple of those. Uh, I think telomere shortening is another good candidate for one of those mechanisms. Um, and it may be, you know, more important for some diseases and more important in some tissues than others. Uh, certainly, if you look at it, it, it's a driver of cell senescence. Uh, it's a driver of, uh, can be a driver of, uh, uh, of cancer. Uh, so it, there's a shortening telomeres is probably a, um, uh, a relevant aspect of aging. And some of the interventions that are aimed at trying to extend telomere length are interesting things to study. Now, I've yet to find compelling evidence that extending telomere length extends lifespan in mammalian models. There's some initial evidence that's promising, but I, I don't know that it's compelling yet. But I certainly consider it as one of the probable mechanisms that's uh, co contributing to drive aging. I think that, you know, th these kinds of things are hard to measure. You know, I've certainly spent a lot of time and effort in airline miles reaching out to everybody they listen to tell them that, you know, we need to target aging. You know, that uh, this is, uh, um, it's, it's something that we have to do with the changing demographics of the globe. Uh, and I think people are beginning to listen. I think some people are kind of all in when they hear that. You know, it's kind of like the idea of, you know, this just keep you functioning whether rather than wait till you break and put you back, try to put you back together again, which is what we're doing with disease. But I think the general public is slowly moving in that direction. People are starting to become aware. Uh, government officials are starting to pay attention. Pharma companies and investors are starting to jump in. So um, I think we're making a lot of progress. I think the question is, when do we reach that tipping point? to where we can really put a lot of resources into this problem and really have a lot of support for trying to develop health span interventions. That's the key point to reach. And it's, you know, I think we're a lot closer than we were five years ago, but, you know, if it's going to happen this year or next year or 10 years from now, it's still hard to predict. We all need to, people that believe in this cause need to keep pushing on this because I think it's so important. Almost everything I do is trying to support aging research, but I have many hats that I wear. So I'm CEO of the Buck, but I also have my own research lab at the Buck Institute. I have another laboratory in China, uh, and I'm involved with uh, uh, a whole range of philanthropists, investors, uh, um, companies that are focused around issues related to aging. So, um, 
you know, in Russia, we were talking about uh, developing a um, uh, investment fund focused on uh, companies that are in early stages trying to target the aging process. Uh, you consider that concept. Uh, in uh, China, I was meeting with some a company that is trying to develop some drugs that may be uh, successful at slowing aging. So uh, I do a lot of travel. I think that was the third or fourth trip to Asia this year already. Uh, and I have a, a, a lot of different, I go for a lot of different reasons, but what they have in common is that they're really trying to promote this um, uh, aging research and the uh, development of interventions that'll slow aging and extend health span. We would, we would love to have people uh, reach out to the Buck Institute and, and support the research. You know, philanthropy is uh, almost 20% of our budget. It's a big engine that helps drive this research forward, and it's something that we're, we are very privileged to, to have some of, and we'd love to get access to more. I think we can really do a lot of good if we can enhance philanthropy. I won't say anything bad about SIMS either. I think they do some very interesting science. So, so I, I'm not going to uh, judge between the two institutions. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, I think that it's also you know try, there is a lot of public movement right now. There's there, there are policy efforts to get. Uh, politicians to pay attention and so writing to your congressman reaching out to people you know in the biotech sector uh, potential investors trying to awaken wake them up to this new concept this is a, a medical revolution that's going to happen I think in this half of this century we're right at the cusp of it and the people that get involved now are going to really be happy that they did Yeah, I, I don't know that we're that far away. I mean, the the first thing to say is that they, there already is an anti-aging industry that's out there. Uh, it's like a $5 billion industry, and it includes things like skin creams, hormones. Uh, there's that guy in the back of the airplane that you see, in the, or the back of the magazine that you see in the airplane, you know, that's 75 years old and looks like a bodybuilder. I think the, the problem is that that market is a lot of people don't believe in these interventions and i don't either because they haven't been tested so what we're trying to do is to take that concept and really bring the re bring research supported um, things to the market that can really help people uh, it may be that some of those things that are already out there help people we just don't know so you know the metformin trial is a good start uh, you know if that proves to have an effect on health span it might be something that you can see implemented in not in the you know, in the next not too distant future. But I also think that there are a lot of other strategies out there that are interesting. Um, one of them is uh, through uh, Walter Longo's work down at USC. They're beginning to, and, and at full disclosure, I have some involvement with this company. So take that, take whatever I say if you want with a grain of salt. But I think that um, they're developing diets now uh, that are fasting mimicking diets that are designed to slow aging. And at least in the animal models, they have that effect. So, uh, and you know, so this is a, a diet you would take every three weeks or every month for four days, and you eat what you get in this box, and it's designed to give you uh, some nutrition, but to, to give you a very low calorie intake and to turn down certain pathways in the body that are associated with aging. There are other strategies like that out there now that may work as well. You probably may have heard of the 5-2 diet where you eat normally for five days and then you fast or come close to fasting for two days a week. Uh, so I think that, you know, strategies to sort of get the benefits of intermittent fasting may be some of the first things that I think we can maybe get behind and really say that have a credible chance of, of slowing aging. But I think drugs will come. It's just a matter of getting the resources and the avenues to test them. So, um, yeah, first of all, for the Institute, you can go to thebuck.org. We have a website that has a lot of information on it and connections if you want to reach out to people and uh, come tour the Institute, um, get more information about some of our membership organizations. We have a, a number of different levels of membership. So, um, we're happy to provide any of that information. It's, so, it's thebuck.org. Um, 
the uh, what I would say is the take home message is that look, in the near future, almost 25% of the population is going to be over the age of 60. We're getting more and more chronic diseases. Life expectancy is not really going up much in the U.S. right now. Healthcare costs are skyrocketing, and we need a new system to deal with this. We need a we need a revolution to to deal with this to keep people healthy longer to make allow them to enjoy their later part of their lives, and that's we have a strategy that's going to work. We know at least in animal models we can target aging, and when we do, these animals are healthy longer, they're functional longer, uh, they seem to be. They seem to have higher cognitive function for longer. Uh, we have to we have to get more people to believe in this mission and to develop strategies where we can test this in humans. And that's happening, but we have to find ways to accelerate that because it's too slow right now, and there's just not enough resources available to really test all these good ideas that are out there.